everybody. This is another episode of Cross Border Talks. I hope your favorite show on international relations. And today our guest is an expert on Germany and energy. So the two questions that seem really disturbing nowadays for everybody living in Europe, Western, Eastern, whatever. Łukasz Dąbrowiecki is a Polish journalist specializing in Germany and also a researcher who is now preparing his PhD on social and political factors that shape energy systems. So a very important, very interesting topic. And I will host this episode together with my friend Veronika Susowa salminen Czech Republic. So before we ask the first question, I just ask you to subscribe Cross Border Talks channel to not to miss any episode. And so that we don't lose any more time. Hello, Lukash. Hello, thank you for having me and I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. And so let's go, Veronika, your first question. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, I would uh, like to start with the first more general question for Lukash, which will be related to something what is, I think, very important for Germany at the moment, uh, but uh, it is interesting also from the non-German point of view, uh, that is uh, to have a look on the legacy of Angela Merkel as a chancellor of Germany, because I noticed now recently a few articles in Germany which were suddenly speaking about the legacy of uh, Merkel in uh, the German politics, and uh, the, this legacy was suddenly seen quite negative, but maybe I read uh, incorrect uh, sources, it can be more complex. And especially there was discussion about the energy policy of A Angela Merkel. So could you give us some uh, view on or view at the situation uh, with, with Angela Merkel legacy? Specifically now, I would like to ask in the first question about her policy, energy policy called energy vendor. How it is seen now and uh, how is the in general, the German politics, journalism, mm -hmm. and of course the society reacting to uh, in the new context because context changed very much. Yes, I, for a very long time, uh, Angela Merkel had a great support and also was viewed for, from other countries of Europe as a very stable, wise, and like forecasting politicians, very calm and uh, great leader for the Europe on the dangerous times. And from the perspective of today's political situation and uh, uh, energy situation, the uh, view on the po politics of Angela Merkel changes very much. Uh, Germany was um, um, somehow um, uh, informed by other countries that they are uh, energy policy is not going in the right direction and um, but until now it is still supported by Angela Merkel and she did not change her mind uh, I must underline also that she that the energy vendor was not her idea this is the idea which came up already in the end of 70s uh, first report, which was called Energy, Energy Vendor, uh, the Future Without Oil and Uranium, appeared in 1980, produced by the Institute, uh, OCO Institute from Freiburg. And this uh, idea was growing uh, in the margins of political scene back then. When the uh, Green Party got to the Bundestag, to, to German parliament, in 1983, they had support only about 5% of uh, electorate. And this idea was going through the decades into the center of the political scene. And name of uh, Angela Merkel was somehow binded with the, with the notion because of her so-called U-turn in uh, 2011 after Fukushima um, disaster. And uh, when she stepped out and she said that for now, like as for now, she was a supporter of, of, of nuclear energy, uh, but uh, taking this uh, circumstances, she's changing her mind and she's calling for closing up all the uh, German nuclear power plants. 
It was just a few months after that uh, CDU uh, coalition and herself, they prolonged uh, the time uh, we, in which the nuclear uh, power uh, plants fleet would work in Germany until half of the 30s. And uh, so her name was somehow binded to, to the idea of the of Energiewende. But the idea itself was, was growing since very long time. And the first introduction of, of the idea was during the, the pol in, in the political sense, was in 1990, when the first uh, uh, policy was introduced uh, already during the um, uh, unification of Germany, where the um, so-called green, sources or renewable sources were somehow privileged in the um, becoming more and more free market of energy. But they got some kind of the boost and privilege in the in this in this market. We have uh, we have to also remember that this very the, the, the energy market is very complicated structure. Uh, Yes, and, and the first government of uh, SPD and Greens in half of the uh, 90s, they introduced the, the first, I would say, chapter of Atom Aussteig, what means the going out of the nuclear uh, power, which then was somehow stopped and slowed by CDU and then Angela Merkel did it once again. So uh, it created the situation and the, what was the alternative for Germany? And it is the, fam the, the famous worldwide famous alternative is renewables plus, and the, it is not very, I mean, it is usually uh, said silent, plus uh, Erdgas, so the natural gas. And the natural gas was coming from Russia, from Russian Federation. And that's the, at, and this is, at, it was the whole plan. So we have totally different energy system. We exclude uh, nuclear first, we exclude then coal, hard coal, and then we exclude lignite, so the brown coal, and still Germany has this plan. So the, the coal should be excluded in 2038. Uh, everybody asked questions why the coal is the last one when it is the, like the, the most dangerous for the climate and the nuclear was the first. And the idea was, so we exclude those uh, resources, but we put renewables, so wind and solar, supported by the uh, natural gas, which uh, was called like a bridge source of energy. But actually nobody, you, nobody could explain bridge to what? Like what is the final aim? Because if we think technologically, 100% of renewables is actually impossible in the technological stage at which we are in now. So the question was like, for how long this, this uh, natural gas will work and, and toward what aim we are, tar target we are going to. So the, now the whole criticism comes out. The, the whole idea was to, uh, on one hand, uh, somehow work hand in hand with Russians. And somehow there is this call, I would say that through the German door, Europe somehow is being called or were to be colonized by the Russian, Russian Federation or Russian resources. And from this point of view, and the outcome of this policy, so the, the war in Ukraine, 
the legacy of, of Angela Merkel looks very, very murky, very in, in dark colors. You actually nicely made oven tour for my next question because I actually wanted to ask exactly this question about Angela Merkel, Merkel's legacy related to the so-called Russia policy. You already mentioned uh, the problem with um, with a gas. Now, now it's called more dependency. Before it was called more as a cooperation if we remember the older times, cooperation with Russia in order to buy from Russia, make Russia dependent basically on, on the money from Europe or from Germany, and on the other hand, uh, make, make uh, Germany and Europe dependent on the Russian gas. This seems to be now um, something which went in total ruins. It's not, uh, not working anymore. And again, the criticism goes to Merkel that her policy was wrong. On the other hand, we have to, however, say that I think, as you said about the energy vendor, uh, the Russia policy of Germany was longer than, than Merkel. I think she just took over yeah. the ideas which were before. And uh, we have to also admit that the final break and crisis with Russia happened after she left office not during yes. her tenure which is interesting topic because the thing started really escalate when Merkel left yes. not until Merkel was there with uh, this uh, in the office so how to evaluate this her policy was it completely wrong or the assumption were completely wrong and in Germany now they believe that uh, it's it's complete disaster or it's more nuanced uh, well I think that there is this notion of the Wandel uh, durch Handel, so the change through the trade. And it somehow it was a copy of what was the policy of United States toward China. So the idea was that if we open our markets, if we start, start to uh, collaborate uh, on the economical level, then our partner, which we uh, see as undemocratic, it will change the rules. And the whole there was this whole long-standing idea of liberalism that liberalism brings democracy. And as we saw that it failed somehow toward China, it failed also toward Russia. Uh, in Germany, there is this also notion about Russenversteher, so the people who understand Russia. And usually, I mean, I would say in East, um, East Union countries, usually we see it as a label for some part of the leftist scene in Germany, which is not true. Uh, I mean, there are some leftists or leftist organizations which somehow still mistake today's Moscow with some kind of revolutionary force or whatever from 1970, which is of course not true. Um, but there is also this um, part of, I would say, industrial, German industrial complex. I mean, uh, people who were in trade and people who would understand Russia better would be also uh, perceived as uh, people who can really uh, swiftly collaborate with our counterpart partners in Russia because they understand them. So, but you better if you better understand your understand your partner, you can uh, somehow obtain more um, credibility and more profits for both sides. And this uh, this notion of Russenversteher did not function as a uh, as a bad name until lately, actually. So. You could you could meet actually people who were proud of understanding Russia, and now appeared that this understanding also completely failed. Uh, it appeared that um, people who would think that that 
Russia under Putin can change, they were absolutely wrong. And they were absolutely wrong since the, be the beginning of the whole story. So since both Chechenian wars, like, you know, attacks, invasions on, on our, our other countries during the during Putin's, Putin regime. So as you said, the whole policy and the whole idea of collaboration, the whole idea of Wandel durch Handel just collapsed. And Germany are now in very interesting moment of seeking and trying to find new way to go around things like what is the position the position on the market in european politics like how they should play this game and yeah and it's very interesting moment that we are in in europe generally also okay so let us talk a bit more about europe Germany's position in the European Union was based on successful economics. Now, when the economy of Germany is facing really murky future, then the question arises, what about Germany's role in the European Union? Olaf Scholz has already proclaimed a couple of uh, ambitious plans of union reform, including the uh, um, um, including the new system of voting of the state members on the European Union. But the question is, will Germany keep any political influence to see these ideas progressing? And mm. uh, also at this moment, I wanted to ask uh, if energy vendor was a failure in the long term, then what can it be? What can be the replacement? What are the ideas in German establishment? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, maybe first uh, I will start from the, yeah, okay, well, let's start from the beginning. So, Germany, we, we must remember, Germany is the fourth economy of the world. It's like an uh, unprecedented force also in Europe. So, they do not, after Brexit, they, ha they have no partners here on the continent economically. They are the strongest. And, and for sure, the rest of the Europe somehow have to deal with this. And Germany, I would say, always would, wanted to see itself as a leader of, of Europe, also because of the historic background but was not grown up enough to this task, I would say. And the, the whole energy policy so, serves as a good example that the horizon of political thinking in Germany is just too narrow. And uh, I wouldn't say that anti-German policy, which we can now see, for example, in Warsaw, will lead us to anywhere, like to any good place. I would say that only the, the cooperation inside and helping, I would say, helping Germany to become uh, more responsible and um, yeah, seeing in a more distant way leader would be would be the role also of, of other countries. And um, during the energy crisis, we, we saw also very, um, un, I would say, um, unhappy uh, competition between countries. So instead of cooperation on energy, uh, level, we saw competition uh, between countries who also, like also Germany, who started to, for example, nationalize energy companies. So we are going back on in the, those terms, we are going back to the times where instead of collaboration, Europe was competing and we know how it ended. Uh, so we have to turn this position of European countries. We have to go back 
to the cooperation, not to the competition on the uh, European or in the world energy markets. For sure, I mean, everybody is talking about the energy crisis also in Germany, but I would not say it is the case. It is very strong economy. Last week, uh, government decided to take another uh, piece of debt, 200 billions to put a, a price cap on energy prices. Uh, the country has a great, I would say, firepower in economical terms to buy energy sources from all over the world, which is Germany doing as we speak, which also somehow have a bad consequences to other countries, non-European countries, which are just weaker on the global energy market. So this uh, huge, um, power, which represents uh, German economy, is also disrupting somehow the situation outside of, of Europe. And of course, the third thing is uh, we have to remember that Germany have the Paris Agreement, so the agreement of uh, cutting down the uh, carbon emissions written into the state law and from the hmm, I would say physical point of view it will be very hard to achieve because um, last month already government decided that uh, more than 20 gigawatts of former closed coal mines also are going back online if they will be needed during the winter. And it was announced by the green vice, vice chancellor. So uh, yeah, vice chancellor, uh, which is uh, Robert Habeck announced that the, the coal, coal uh, sorry, coal power plants, not coal mines, coal power plants are going back uh, to use. So I would not, um, I would not uh, forecast that there will be a somehow a huge energy uh, energy crisis in Germany. I would not say there will be any blackouts. Uh, I think they will manage to gather enough energy resources for everybody, but it causes different kind of problems. It causes the problems for Paris Agreement and cutting down emissions. It causes the problem on the external energy markets for the weaker countries. Uh, and of course, it, it causes the problem of this growing competition between European countries instead of cooperation. And what would be the Hmm. The um, way that, that how, how we could resolve the problem, of course, I, I would say that we would have to go back to the uh, foundations of uh, idea of European Union, for example. So if we had, uh, like, we have to rem remember the one basic commonwealth of European Union was Euroatom. <laughs> That, that was the, the one of the foundations of the, Euro, the, 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 the European Union. So uh, collaborating between countries and putting back a nuclear, German nuclear fleet online would be somehow rational uh, step toward fighting uh, the, the climate crisis and energy crisis. As we know, uh, still three uh, German nuclear reactors are working until the end of the year. And now 
the um, ministry, the, the vice chancellor Habak decided or uh, actually uh, announced that two of them will st still be uh, in use until April next uh, year. So um, as a backup. So uh, we had this advantage of having very powerful uh, energy resources still online, but what then? What 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 after this? Uh, that would need like a create another great Copernican revolution in a in a German German government, which is. Um, yeah, which is mainly uh, anti-nuclear. I mean, both SPD and 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 Green Party is is anti-nuclear. Liberals are also a bit, but they would be more likely to uh, give a green light for the for for the nuclear energy. But we still don't know what 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 will be after. I mean, what will be the energy policy for 2024? I mean, we already know there, there, there is no going back to business as usual with Russia. And uh, how Germany will tailor its uh, energy um, policy, we, we still don't know what, what will be the pillars of the energy system. I must say that I am glad uh, that you are more optimistic about the um, prospects of uh, Germany managing the current crisis, because I was uh, doing small research and I was reading some articles uh, and some statements from uh, different representatives of uh, German industry, and their opinions about the prospects were not so lightful, not so not so optimistic. They were pointing out uh, that. The current crisis is really beating, especially the smaller firms. Uh, that means firms which have uh, less than 1,000 uh, employees. Uh, they were claiming that the, the energy uh, consumption of the German industry fall until now, until the September 21%. But the reason is uh, that the out um, uh, the, the the production the production uh, went also down. Many firms are putting down their production because of the prices. This is one of the risks which I would like to ask you, because the prices of energy are high. It's not just that you get the ener energy in Germany. No doubt that Germany has enough force, diplomatic, and enough big position. It can bring. Uh, gas from Qatar or America or whatever you, you that's that's no doubt but the price level is such that these firms are not uh, dealing with it or they are they have huge dif uh, difficulties and I'm asking this because I read in several articles and several statements that if the situation will be not hold under the control Germany is facing a threat of deindustrialization, and this of course will have uh, not only European, but global consequences. But as Central Europeans, we are really concerned about this because as everybody of us know, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Slovenia, but also Romania in, 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 the, in the Balkans, they all are very much dependent and interconnected with the uh, German industry. They became to be the German so-called Central European industry base. So uh, what about this, uh, th this prospects? Is it, uh, is it it's just not to get the enough of energy for this winter in, but there is the economic pressures, there is the competition not in the Europe, but the global competition. The produce of, of steel in Indonesia will be successful now because their prices of final products will be cheaper than the German ones, and they will lose on the global market and so on. So this can really uh, change a lot on the global position of Germany. And finally, I would point out that the German success is based on the, that it integrated as an export and strong industrial country in the current stage of globalization. So this, everything could go in ruin. So what are your thoughts about this? Are there these risks? Is it too much played or, you know, too much, uh, too much over emphasize some problems than others. Uh, 
Um, I I would not forecast. I even we, nobody knows. I, I would say nobody knows what we know that Olaf Scholz was already changing his mind on the economic policies. We we remember him as a finance ministry, which was very conservative and strict on the on the debt, and he was following the I would say this third way of pink uh, social democrats. And then during the um, uh, coronavirus crisis, he changed changed his mind. He prepared a stabilization program, like the, so, so the he gave like the great uh, influx of the money for also the small and and middle uh, companies. And that's how that, that that's why Germany actually went through the coronavirus crisis like very well i mean the unemployment was very low and and the country was economically economically stable the the second thing is we have to remember that um, germany already before any of those crises had the highest uh, prices for energy in europe after denmark uh, but uh, industry had different prices. Industry was in excluded from the from the actual um, market mechanism, and they were protected uh, before the the outcomes of energy vent actually, because the German Germans had to pay additional fees and were were actually financing from their pockets, this huge development of, of wind and solar. And of course, we have to be grateful somehow that they finance the whole development because the, the, the technology can be used nowadays thanks to this uh, final, uh, finalization, financialization. But uh, so we already know that uh, some, like companies like Uniper, were nationalized. Uh, we know that there will be a, a price cap on the energy prices, which was the, the bill was introduced last week. And we will see how it will develop in which, because we see that governmental um, decisions, which were, would be not, like they would be unthinkable two, three years ago. I mean, if, Anybody would told us that European countries will be nationalizing uh, energy companies and will be putting the uh, cap price caps on on energy uh, prices. We would say how like what <laughs> we usually had like neoliberal policy and it's like counter neoliberal policy. And we will see where where it will lead i mean because of course it is a tool which you can use in you know different ways and we will see who will finally will be profiting from it but i i think they they are preparing some kind of the huh, uh, buffer to 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 not be struck hard by the by the uh, prices and of course like industrial sector usually is not you know pleased with such policies and they will always say that they will lose competition and they should need more uh, support and so on and so on but i think we are going in a in an interesting direction the the proposition of giving a pool of energy uh, which will be like very low priced and then somehow if you uh, use your limit uh, energy limit you have to pay more like market prices this is also a very interesting mechanism as far as i know it was until now um, exercised only in some states of united states in 70s and uh, also in Italy, but uh, the idea of uh, uh, like 
staging or growing uh, energy uh, prices uh, measured by the use of uh, of energy it's it's very interesting idea so the the person or the company which uses more of the more amount of energy would have to pay more uh, it's it's interesting for, i would say from also left uh, perspective Le yeah leftist perspective When Olaf Scholz and his party were winning the elections, a lot of leftists indeed looked at Germany uh, with hope that if the strongest economy in the European Union is now ruled by left-wing people, even if they are just social democrats, then perhaps Germany will be, can become a kind of laboratory of pro-social solutions or pro-social ideas that could be then implemented everywhere on the continent. And what you were talking about with this uh, idea of pool of energy is indeed very interesting from the left-wing point of view. We had also the experiment with the nine euro uh, tickets during yeah. the holidays. So perhaps indeed something is going on. But I need to ask the question from a bit of different angle. Now when the crisis is nevertheless coming to Germany too, because the prices, prices are getting higher and the energy prices for ordinary people are also getting higher, mm -hmm. should we expect more social tensions in Germany? Should we expect more protests or more activity of social organizations such as labor unions? Or would the government be skillful enough to prevent these tensions with able politics? I know you are not keen on forecasting, but perhaps could you share your ideas in this resort? Yeah, I think it's the, again, it's the factor of like, how, what will be the outcome of the policies which are created as we speak? So we actually, don't know how they will work and how the people will react and what will be. Of course, it's the season for the right wing. I mean, well, like in Italy and other countries, also in, in Germany, uh, we can see the, the situation where we have growing prices and inflation this is the this is the moment when the right wingers can you know uh, fish in the dark waters how they will be organized and how people will really react how if if there will be a real loss of jobs we will see in a you know in in coming months but if there will be a loss of jobs I don't know. As I said, uh, during the coronavirus, people were actually surprised and struck how Germany came, economy, how it came through the, the, the whole crisis, actually in a good shape. So I, I, will, not, I will not forecast anything, we don't know. I, what I can say, the problem can appear next year. I mean, because now there is a still kind of hope, you know, when, when there is a kind of hope, like we are changing the policies, we are trying to um, gather energy sources uh, and then winter comes. So we will be having, you know, reality check. And everything depends on this on this reality check if the policies will play or not. And then the next year, I would say, will be the real, um, probably the real play field of of the social movements and political movements when they will have arguments in the in in the hands. So the policies will fail or not. So there will be a concrete argument. 
Okay, I think our talk is coming to the end. Uh, I thank you very much, Lukas, for your interesting ideas and comments about the energy crisis in Germany and politics in Germany. I must say, as a Czech, seeing the, your analysis of the German situation, I'm a bit calmer on one hand. On the other hand, I'm not calmer when I see what is going with the Czech government with the energy crisis. Uh, because there we see already demonstration and protests uh, because the government is uh, having no plan. So, uh, which is interesting because if the Czech Republic fails, I think in Germany they will be not very happy. But uh, uh, we will see. Uh, I hope that this optimistic prognosis of yours will be valid because, uh, of course, uh, this perspective which uh, we can see around were not looking very good. And I wish everybody a nice uh, day or evening whenever they listen to us. I will remind uh, everybody that we have several channels through which you can listen and uh, see our interviews of cross-border talks. I also thank Malgor Jata for being with me and moderating this uh, episode. And I wish everybody good day, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye. <laughs>